Kicking off the list at number 10, a lot of hair. To kick off this wild part two, I had to include the tale of the woman who ate her own hair. Why did she do it? What happened? How much hair? Well, let's find out. All the questions about to be answered. The Liverpool Daily Post back in 1869 got the attention of those passerbyers with this one. A 30 year old passed away in the village of Lincolnshire. That's not too far off from the average life expectancy in the 1800s. But this case, this case was a little odd. Something was off about it. So doctors asked the family if they could carry out a post mortem. And lo and behold, a two pound solid chunk of hair was sitting in her stomach. It caused ulcerations of the stomach and ultimately caused her death. What a horrible way to go out. The woman's sister didn't know that over the last dozen years or so, she had been casually eating her own hair. Just one piece every now and then. Ultimately, it added up. If you know anybody that's eating their own hair, pass this on. Send them this video. This sounds rather uncomfortable. Number nine, cat attack. If I have to pick, I would say I'm 100% a dog guy. Cats are cool, don't get me wrong, but this next story freaks me out a bit. Also, I had a cat once and I pulled its tail on it. <laughs> pissed at me and scratched me and scared the life out of me. So, dog, dogs for sure. Back in 1870, a rich woman had put her time, energy, and resources into cat breeding. What a fun little hobby and lifestyle. She had tons of cats, she loved them all equally, and they loved her. I'm allergic also, so this story is my nightmare on a level. But it does sound like a cute time, I'll admit, that's a nice way. Especially like in the Victorian era, what a, what a lovely little pocket of fun. 1800s, a lot of candles, everything being extremely flammable, disaster hit often in Victorian times. And in 1870, a fire broke out of this young woman's home, and the cats were sadly trapped in the house. They made it out alive, but by the time they made it out, the two maids that had kicked the door open to rescue them, they had gone full primal. The cats just attacked them and it was all bad. The fire in the house had obviously scared them, so when the doors were open, these two maids were both attacked by them at full force, essentially. All of these cats. Like, what a horrible thank you for saving all of their lives, you know what I mean? Number eight, quick divorce. Let's just say the love thing isn't working out, okay? It happens, people change, but now what? Say it's the Victorian era, but divorce in England isn't allowed until 1857, and it's 1856. So now what are we gonna do? Well, considering what list we're on and which part it is, it's pretty wildly unfair. If you were the wife, you were getting sold in this scenario. How horrible is that? Wife sellers, they were a thing. That was a legitimate business, how horrible. Yeah, you were getting sold if you were the wife. How horrible is that? Wife sellers was a legitimate business. There were auctions, public auctions would be done. You would watch people bid on marrying your wife. At like noon, middle of the day, people are walking by like, oh, do I have any change, hang on. This is insane. One real sale that happened in 1862 was in Selby. The asking price was a beer. The asking price for this person's wife was one pint. Sold, just like that, that's crazy. Sold, drank, now I'm married. That's insane. Other times, most of the time, it was a rather expensive exchange. I feel like there are plenty of cases where this would honestly be the ideal scenario. Just get it done in one day, whatever, peace. See you again, bye, you're the worst. Number seven, Rivet Rosie. I did mention this in my World War I video, but this is where the magic really happened. Rivet Rosie, editor, put a picture up. Uh, Rivet Rosie, right back there or something. P put a picture, or maybe in front of me, I don't know. Rivet Rosie. Some theory holds water here. We needed the ladies to roll up their sleeves and start welding, stamping, and producing war materials for the war effort. World War II was the most destructive war in human history, but something that I think just doesn't get talked about enough is the massive logistics issue that went on. Millions of resources being manufactured and shipped all over the world from the US just to put a stop to the mustache man and his two henchmen. Not one tank, gun, bullet, or bootstrap would be possible without the efforts of women in factories. And that's just the truth. Number six, mother. Hey, listen, being a mom is tough. It's a process, a lot of ups, a lot of downs. But sadly, a lot of moms got knocks on the doors in the 1940s when they didn't want to. Got a folded American flag and condolences from Uncle Sam. Given the number of men that lost their lives during the conflict, it's a knock on the door that happened all too often. However, on the other side of the pond, it was a similar story, except in places like Berlin, there was no door, or maybe even a house, because it was bombed to smithereens. Imagine trying to raise a kid in a place like that. When your town looks like something from Fallout, yeah, it's not easy. So, shout out to all the moms out there that lived through it one day at a time and made it through. Number five, Sniper. Lyudmila Pavelchenko was a Russian sharpshooter during World War II. This is a woman who was in active combat and is credited with over 300 KIAs. 
That's a lot of dudes. See, this is a lady we need a movie or a game about Hollywood. While in quality of the 1940s was very much existent in the Soviet Union during World War II, her, her bravery and service is to be commemorated. But if you know history, and you know how well the Russian invasion went for Germany, and especially in the first few months, the Soviet Union applied a strategy I like to call anything goes. Meaning, until they received supplies and aid from their newly found allies to the east, Russia, being Russia, was going to throw anything at the Germans to stop them. That included female soldiers on the ground. She was one of a few Russian sharpshooters that proved to be very effective in combat and as a tool of propaganda for the state. It just makes sense. Number four, Nagasaki. This one is a broad stroke, but basically anyone who was in Hiroshima or Nagasaki, finger quote, working on those special days, that counts as an unusual job. Maybe you've worked construction, or you worked some really hot sunny days. It's rough, maybe you worked in an office where the gears of bureaucracy and red tape hold you back from doing your best. Headache maker, am I right? Imagine you're working your job and literally 10 seconds later, you hear the largest bomb ever to fall on a city all of a sudden. And it's gone, like the city's just gone. It was there a second ago, but now it's gone. I don't want to get into too much horrific detail in case the YouTube gods are listening and they might smite me, but Google Hiroshima and Nagasaki. You'll see what I mean. Number three, pinup girl. Models, actresses, and anyone who had hips that don't lie had their images printed, painted, and posted everywhere for informal display. That's right, informal. Intentions on this one are completely dishonorable. But at the same time, might have helped, I don't know. Where would we be if Betty Grable wasn't showing some ankle on every B-52 bomber that was Berlin bound? See? Exactly. I know. Ask Grandpa, he'll tell you. While these glamorous ladies may not have been directly involved in the war effort, it was their job to remind those boys just what they were fighting for. I salute you, sailors. Number two, code breakers. This was a time before computers and the internet. So if a German code came across your desk, you couldn't just ask Google, what in the heck does that mean? We owe a lot to the code breakers. Shout out to Alan Turing. Cause he, he's pretty smart. But it's the women in all the military offices everywhere in every allied nation working every day to make the enemy's information get revealed. It's actually very important that happens, trust me. Which in the long run saved lives. A lot of lives. I'll be honest too, some of the stuff they had to help decipher wasn't easy. I struggled enough with Call of Duty zombie Easter eggs. Yeah, don't don't call me for that. I, I'll, t I'll carry you to high rounds, but I can't get you. I can't solve the Easter egg, man. I'll carry you, but it's not gonna happen. Number one, everyone else. This one goes out to every woman who, in some way or another, participated in the world's worst conflict. Mothers, nurses, doctors, code breakers, everyone. I'm putting a blanket over everyone here because there's just there's too many not to mention. But the point I'm getting across is that we could not have done it without the help of girl power. And here at Bumblebee, we remember that. And me, Chetty, your local Chris Farley or John Candy or something in between, whatever I am. Remember, I salute you ladies. Thank you for your service. Number 10, Queen Victoria. It's so bly yourself. Her Royal Majesty and Queen of the British Empire. Queen Victoria. She's responsible for a lot of things, including a nice long holiday in the summer where dads get to be irresponsible with fireworks. Nice. All fun jokes aside, she was the queen of the monarch and she wasn't the worst queen ever, but uh, during her reign, the British Empire had never really been stronger as it took part in absorbing many smaller nations into the empire. And they didn't ask nicely if you catch my drift. India, China, and uh, a lot of parts of Africa. Africa had a rough time back then. It was pretty hard for that continent. They all felt the wrath of the queen's expansionist fist. It's really sad, actually. Goddamn. Number nine, thieves. Times, specifically in Victorian London, weren't the best. It most certainly wasn't the cleanliest place on earth, and there were orphans asking for more porridge. I don't know. I didn't read the book, guys. Sorry. Lack of rights, social expectations and pressure, and a lot of double standards. Honestly, it just wasn't an easy time for women. Well, it shouldn't really come as a surprise, but thievery and pickpocketing were often done even by women, though. I mean, what choice do you have at that point? The idea of ladies was so ladylike or elegant that it wasn't possible, or at least people thought it wasn't possible, that they could be criminals. What a backhanded compliment. A woman a criminal? I certainly don't think so, sir. It's not possible. It's very possible. There are tons of thieves and pickpockets. That's just ridiculous. Number eight, Jane Toppin. Take a trip with me to Boston. We can see Bunker Hill, Old North Church, and Fanu Hall. Ooh, cool. We could also visit a very nice nurse from the 1880s who was taking care of the elderly. Jolly Jane, as she became to be known, was a nurse who took care of the elderly. And by take care, I mean the same way you took care of your first hamster. 
Mmm, yeah, not so great, was it? Now, how did he know that? I know. She would dose up the old geezers with a healthy Keith Richards sized dose of morphine. Yeah! There's only so much rock stars that can handle that level of rock and roll. And guys, grandma and grandpa, they're not one of them. They can't handle that kind of stuff. After that, she would lay down with them and just like chill with the body, because that's, that's what you do. Ugh. Before she was caught, there was an estimated 31 grandmas and grandpas not at the dinner table after having her as a nurse. I'm just gonna lay down right beside you. It's gonna be great. I'm just gonna lay down. <laughs> at number seven, Satan's incarnate. Back in the medieval age, women were very much oppressed and incredibly misunderstood. I mean, they thought so many women were witches, and as time went on, the criteria for diagnosing a woman with witchitis or whatever got bigger and bigger to the point where literally any woman could be accused of being a witch for the most BS reasons. Back then, people thought that women were Satan's incarnate, and so they were predisposed to sin, and therefore, they had to be witches. Logic, not quite present, but go off, I guess. There were four reasons why a woman could be considered part of the devil's posse. One, because it was believed that women are foolish and gullible, which is why they turned to magic. Two, because women are insatiable when it comes to their carnal pleasures, and so they seek out help from the devil to satiate their needs. Three, because women talk a lot and we speak lies, apparently. And four, because women are weak, and the only way we can seek revenge is by using magic powers and spells. Now what in the balls is this all about? I don't know. Maybe men in medieval times were just jealous that they couldn't kiki it up with the devil, or because they knew deep down that women run the world. Number six, nosy neighbor. If you were a man back in the Middle Ages and you had an affair, well, you would have to pay a fine. And then that's it. You would go back to your life. But if you're a woman, like everything else on this insane list, it was so, so much worse. Affairs happen a lot, okay? It's normal. Remember that Ashley Madison scandal back in 2015? It sucks, but also it's not surprising at all. This isn't news to us. Back in the Middle Ages, women were treated the worst for these affairs. They would take their noses off. They would literally take a woman's nose and or ears off of their face because they had an affair. Frederick II used to punish adulterers by using renotomy. That was the removal of one's knows. The whole point of this was to make the victim unattractive. Isn't that the worst thing you've ever heard? This is a real thing people did, swear to God. Thing is, nobody is running around confessing that they're cheaters. Somebody has clearly spilled the beans, so they knew what was going to happen if they got caught, yet they would still rat each other out. Meanwhile, the guy just pays a small fee. Snitches get stitches. Just saying. At number five, married young. Lots of people get married at different ages. I mean, I know people I went to high school with who are already married, and I know people who didn't get married until later in life. But in medieval times, women, or rather girls, were getting married off at very young ages. At just 12 years old, a girl would reach the age of maturity and was then entitled to marry, usually to someone her parents had already chosen for her. To me, that just sounds so unfair, right? I mean, this kid hasn't really been able to live their life, make mistakes and learn from them, and now they're expected to be a wife and soon a mother? I could never. I mean, I'm only 22, so I'm not even thinking about those prospects, but I couldn't even imagine the amount of pressure that would be on a 12 year old at the time. What's worse than just the age at which these girls got married was the treatment that they received from their husbands. Under civil law, a husband was literally allowed to physically harm his wife. In moderation, of course. It was actually a medieval tradition for husbands to quote, treat his wife as a pupil and teach her manners. As you could imagine, this made a lot of wives really mad, and so many wives offed their husbands. But things rarely got better after that because if they were caught, they would be sentenced to burn at the stake. Note to self, don't get married in medieval times. Number four, the walk of shame. We've all heard the term walk of shame at some point, but what does it really mean? And also, where did it originally come from? Well, it was originally referred to as a skimmington or rough music. And no, it doesn't mean they would blast Slipknot this whole time. This was done to wives who were bossy or overbearing. They would be forced to walk through the entire town barefoot, all those crooked, horrible stone roads, ankles just toast, it was horrible. They would also be scandally clad too because why not? Because men are making the rules, that's why. And as you guessed it, crowds would be waiting outside, all prepared to bang pans and yell horrible things at her. I guess these dudes just never had jobs. I don't know, they were just always on standby, ready to yell at a lady walking by through town, bare feet, all because she was deemed too bossy. Okay. If you're wondering who exactly is responsible for these public humiliations, um, the court. The official court. 
Judge Judy back in the day would be like, yes or no, did you raise your voice? Okay, case dismissed. Take your shoes off, we're done here. What a joke. At number three, ladies of the night. Sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do to get that coin, right? We all have our side hustles and dead end jobs to be able to afford rent and whatnot. And sometimes we're not exactly proud of the work that we do to make money. It was the same back in medieval times. People had to find any means to make money and for a lot of women, they used what their mama gave them to support themselves and their families. One of the more positive sides of life for women in medieval times was the fact that being a woman of the night was actually a recognized profession. Later on throughout the times, this profession would be deemed illegal, but in medieval times, it was as common as being a baker or something. These women were actually considered to be merchants because they sold their bodies as if it was any other sellable good. Being a woman of the night was such a common and widespread profession that nearly every town in medieval times had a brothel, even in towns with small populations. So yeah, maybe they didn't have that big of a marketplace, but they no doubt had a place where you could go see some quality mommy milkers. Number two, grand theft witchcraft. If you were a woman in the middle ages, you were accused of being a witch pretty often. They thought women communicated with the devil like Brie mentioned earlier, just because some townsfolk with three teeth said so. Great, thanks Abe, good job, good report. The punishment for practicing witchcraft wasn't a heavy fine like guys who cheated, but they would be burnt at the stake. This was popular in Scotland along with drowning. Those are the two big ones. Remember earlier how I said women would sometimes be dipped into a river or a pond? Well, they would also sometimes just be left there. It's called witch dipping, and depending on if she floated or sank, that's, you know, witch or not. The dumbest thing I ever heard. If you were charged with treason or witchcraft, that was the ideal punishment because it surely beats burning to death in front of an entire village. This all got out of control come the start of the 17th century with the Salem witch trials. That's when people were like, you know what, I think this is wrong. I think we should stop. Let's put this torch out. I think we're good. That's when 19 people were executed for being witches. God forbid you knew how to do bed mass in the Middle Ages. Also, that's a lot of coordination to get that many townsfolk together and be like, okay, you need this, you need this. How many people are standing here? Almost like you would use basic math to figure that out. You're a witch too. Spoiler alert, we're all witches, because we know things. I don't know, I hate this. And finally at number one, crimes of the heart. For some unknown reason, people were really out here in these streets in medieval times trying to accuse women of everything. Witchcraft was a common accusation, but the other common crime that women were often accused of was adultery. But you see, the thing is, Someone could accuse a woman of adultery even if she never had physical contact with another person. Now, how the heck does that work, you ask? Well, it depended on where these people lived. During the medieval age in the Byzantine Empire, it was considered adultery if they spent a night outside of their husbands or parents' homes. In Slavic parts of Europe, a woman could be considered guilty of infidelity for simply going to a public event. I'm pretty sure with this logic, if you even breathe in the same general vicinity of a man, then you could be accused of adultery. I mean, what the F is that up? The only bright side, I guess, is the fact that when it came down to punishments for adultery, men usually got the worst punishments in comparison to women. However, they would be accused of this crime way less often than women, so I guess in a way we still got the short end of the stick. Damn it. Such as the first one to make me puke, number 10, denailing. It's one of those torment styles I feel needs no explanation. The name kind of says it all, but to include you in the horror, the definition of denailing is the forcible extraction of fingernails or toenails or both. And man, was it a favorite method of the medieval times. And a fun fact I learned, the term cutting it to the quick actually originates with this horrible punishment. The quick is the nickname for the fingernail skin, AKA hypocachium. So when you're cutting it to the quick, you're digging up someone's fingernails. In its simplest form, denailing was done by first constraining the prisoner on whatever tabletop or chair, whatever you got ready to tie a person to. Then metal forceps or pliers, often heated over fire until red hot, grasp each nail at its edge and tear it from its nail or toe bed. Okay, Ma, this right here is why I am okay with the fact you never broke my nail biting habit. Unfortunately for me, the other variant of this would have still worked because in version two, they wedged something under the nail first and then hit it inwards to separate the nail from its bed. This was a favored method of the medieval German witch hunters who would dip the wooden skewers in boiling sulfur before wedging them in, which would burn the incredibly sensitive flesh of the underside of the nail. When enough skewers have been driven home to ply each nail loose from the bed, only then is the nail torn from the root with a pair of pliers. Okay, one and done. Let's hit number nine, which is stocks. And just like the stock market, it's scary and confusing The people involved are sitting on their ass. Sorry, the joke was there, I had to go for it. So, stock is both 
both physical torment and public humiliation, the best of both types of medieval punishments. Okay, so you know that thing where they bend you over and they put your head and your wrists in it like this, as seen in the beautiful period piece, Shrek? The stocks are similar, but for your feet. Difference is, is that a person is placed in the stocks sitting with their legs extended in front of them and their feet are locked into place. Sometimes their hands or their head might be chained for funsies too, but overall they're left lying on the ground or if they're lucky they have something under their butt. Stocks could be found in the most public places available where a town crier would come out shaking that big ass bell and telling the board masses they could contribute to punishing offenders against the standard of conduct of the time, AKA free for all. See this defenseless person literally lying on the ground having an existential crisis because all they did was have a pimple that looked kind of like a witch spot and now their feet are in a Lego block? Get some repressed unacknowledged feelings out. Feel free to berate, attack, spit, kick, urinate, defecate, or even violate the man or woman in their immovable state. This was super popular among civil authorities in medieval times and was at its peak use during the Elizabethan England and the Spanish conquistadors tormenting those in the new world who fought back against Christianization. It was not uncommon for for people to be kept in stocks for several days to die of hypothermia or heat stroke. Number eight is the Catherine Wheel, which was named after St. Catherine of Alexandria, who wasn't ever actually killed on one of these, but the fictitious story stuck and so did the name. So medieval France and Germany love this bad boy, which was essentially a giant cartwheel put on a lazy Susan. Folks would be stretched out on it and then tied down, then quite literally became a wheel of fortune because ideally the dude wielding the massive hammer taking swings at you while you slowly spin in a circle gets dizzy and misses. More often than not though, folks ain't that lucky. This wheel would be spun nice and slow over the hours and the hammer wielder would break different limbs as they circled past him. Once all the limbs were reduced to spiky bone fragment skin slabs, oh, sorry, but the person was left on the wheel to die. It could take hours, even days before shock and dehydration did its course. If your offense was less severe or you could bribe someone or you were at least well liked, the first blow would be to the neck in hopes of smoking you quickly. Known as coupe de Grace, AKA blows of mercy. Otherwise they went from the feet up baby and the number of sequences of blows are specified in the court sentence. How as a lady did you earn the Catherine's wheel? Cheating, witchcraft, treason. Number seven, the great famine. We're gonna lean out a wife selling for a hot minute and include the boys for this one. Yeah, come on back in, you're all guilty. The Great Famine took out everybody, not just Victorian women, of course. Back in 1845, potato crop that a lot of the Irish population was relying on was no longer available all of a sudden. A group of microorganisms just wiped them out, just like that, and in result, around one million folks died or had to leave. It was draconian law and British ruling that made the exported food hard to reach people that really needed it. So this famine led to Irish independence and anti-union movements. A little fun bit of history I had to include on this one. Number six, the Brooklyn Theater Stampede. And we're back to absolute horribleness. Here we go. I love the theater. When the pandemic shut down plays, I actually felt pretty sad. I like sitting in full rooms watching a guy in a fake wig monologue about Mozart. Like that's my ideal Saturday night. That's the best. I don't want that to not be a thing anymore. I love theater. But today we have an obnoxious amount of distractions that can take you out of the experience. Guy's texting fighting his ex-girlfriend two rows ahead of me. I'm trying to watch Joseph and the amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. I'm like, man, it's not the same anymore. Theater's not the same anymore. Turn off your phone, throw a tomato at him. It can be distracting. Exit signs can also be pretty distracting, but we need them. We definitely need them. Because in 1876, the Brooklyn Theater caught fire after a single lantern fell over on stage during a performance. This was 1876. Everybody was wearing flammable attire. There aren't emergency exits yet. A fire marshal hadn't come in and counted heads at this point, so it was a disaster. 278 people lost their lives. A monument was put up after the incident. It shook the town, it was absolutely horrible. I read about this and I was like, that's horrible. We got included in, this is a horrible list. Number five, the hobble skirt. Yeah, so when people can't get out of burning theaters, it's stuff like this to blame. Just from this 1910 headline alone, I'm glad we don't have hobble skirts anymore. The June 12th, 1910 headline reads, the hobble skirt is the latest freak in women's fashions. The latest freak. Skirts that are so tight around the ankle that locomotion is seriously impeded and speed is impossible. Nice. I'll take two, debit. Doesn't that sound like a bad time? Why would anyone want this? Sounds like you're gonna be late for everything. French designer Paul Poirier made these to free the bust, to free the, you know, have a lot of room in here, whilst shackling the legs. So you in turn have to, you can't move. Just where you need to move around uneven stone roads, I guess. Love the practicality on this one, Paul, thanks. Despite how ridiculous and unsafe the hobble skirt looks and acts, only the wealthy could afford such a thing. 
Shoot, oh man, must be nice. I'll just be over here wearing jeans like an idiot. Middle and lower class women wore skirts with slits or buttons so they could, you know, actually walk around. Yeah, what fools. Oh, sorry, you want a button? <laughs> I don't speak broke, sweetie. Number four, lead based. When I started here at the studio a year and a half ago, maybe two years, I was like, okay, I gotta put on face cream maybe. A lot of, a lot of lights, a lot of HD this. Time to get rid of these bags under my eyes finally. I don't know, maybe drink some water. See what happens. Finding a skincare routine of any sorts is easy now, dare I say. The lovely World Wide Web has our back. You can learn how to draw your eyebrows on while listening to true crime. It's wonderful where we are today. But the cosmetic game, who back in the 18th century, not great. Turns out, wasn't that great. Not that safe. RuPaul's drag race would have been a lethal sport, know what I mean? Back in the 18th century, lead mixed with vinegar was often used to make your face look, you know, more pale. The Victorian look, I guess, gotta have those veins pop out. A splash of sulfur for those freckles. Horrible idea. Queen Elizabeth I used cosmetics containing lead, mercury, and or arsenic. The same poison that took out George III and Napoleon Bonaparte. So, not safe at all in any time, period. In fact, arsenic was on the priority list of hazardous substances, and toxic metal exposure is still an issue we're facing in this era, let alone Victorian. Number three, the Kensington system. Ah, oh, this was horrible. Queen Victoria was brought up under the Kensington system, which if you haven't heard it before is awful. I was grounded more often than not growing up, I'll admit, you know, I was the youngest of three, so I tried some shady stuff every now and then, but this, this is another level. At least I could go to the washroom without supervision, you know what I mean? Yeah, buckle up. Victoria's mother, Duchess Victoria of Kent, she created this Kensington system to control her daughter. She literally isolated the child from friends, family members, anybody, everybody, you name it. Her mother would monitor her every action on top of this, including who she can see or speak to, if there were any of those people at some point. Victoria only had two playmates growing up her entire life. She had her half-sister, Princess Fiodora of Lenigan, and then the Duchess attendant, Sir John Conroy, his daughter, Victoria. I mean, I had like four friends growing up, you know, maybe five, five and a half, but this is just cruel, this is just unfair. Especially with a royalty too, you'd think you can have more things. No, less. She shared a room with her mother until she was a queen. That entire time, she literally couldn't walk down the hallway alone. Victoria has reflected on her childhood, and yeah, in case you're wondering, she hates John Conrad. She referred to him as a demon incarnate, so she's got the words. Number two, arsenic dresses. If looks could kill, literally. You've heard of arsenic and old lace at some point, but what exactly are we talking about? Back in 1861, a poet by the name of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, real name, his wife, Fanny, also real name, her dress caught on fire and her burns were so bad that of course she sadly didn't survive. But this was sadly common in Victorian days. Puffy dresses, open candles as we heard earlier. These dresses back then, they were flammable as is, but some of them were made with literal poison. Some of them had arsenic made to have that like green look, like the real arsenic green look. It wasn't just in clothing either. Back in 1861, an artificial flower maker named Matilda Schurer used green arsenic laced powder and her fingernails had turned green and green foam started coming out of her mouth and it was just a horrible way to go out. Arsenic is not supposed to be inhaled, let alone worn. Although yeah, it did look nice for a hot minute. Not worth it. And finally, number one, Queen Victoria's threats. Being the queen and all, and we're talking about the Victorian era, I figured we'd end with this one. Being the queen and all, a security team is always needed, and during her reign, there were multiple, multiple attempts to harm the young queen. The first attack was back in 1840. It was an 18 year old man named Edward Oxford, and he fired towards the queen's carriage, but obviously and luckily missed. But when Edward was accused of high treason, he was actually found not guilty due to insanity. Then a couple years later, in 1842, it happened again. This time, two men fired at her. They were found guilty. In 1849, her carriage was attacked by William Hamilton. In 1850, as the carriage was passing the gates of Buckingham Palace, Robert Pate, a retired soldier, ran up and hit her with his cane. Victoria was okay, thankfully, but of course, she was shook. Then again in 1842, 1849, and 1872, attempt after attempt. But then things got a little worse. If you haven't heard of Boy Jones or anything that happened here, 
I saved it for last because it's extremely unsettling. A teenager stalked the Queen back in 1838 until 1841. Edward Jones, aka Boy Jones. This guy somehow managed to break into Buckingham Palace more than once. It was some Assassin's Creed type stuff. He just knew some back way, he climbed some window, or whatever. The guy just knew a route in, so he would break in and would more often than not just hide under the Queen's sofa. He would sit on her throne sometimes, and one of the worst things ever, he would go through her drawers and like go through her clothes and stuff. It was creepy. He would steal her clothes until eventually and thankfully he got caught. Number 10, Julie Daubigny, a sword wielding opera singer? Uh, yes, sign me up please. I am so here for this. There is so much to unpack about this story. So she was born the daughter of the secretary of King Louis XIV's master of horse. She moved to the court of Versailles in 1682. Her father was an expert swordsman and educated her alongside the boys he taught because she was his only kid. She even dresses a boy and excelled at the sport. She ran off with a fencing master and toured, showing off her skills to wide audiences. One audience member, however, couldn't believe she was a woman because she was so good, so she flashed the crowd, who responded with complete stunned silence. She began singing at the Marseille Opera where she met her first love, a young woman. This woman though was packed off to a convent by her family and Julie followed to help her escape. They burned down the convent and ran off together and she was actually sentenced to death by the parliament, but Julie would continue to live on one adventure after the next. She would later be pardoned by parliament and continue to go on to become an opera star and had many other lovers. Number 9, Betty Page. If you're a fan of pinup art then you almost have to be a fan of the one the only Betty Page. She is the one who defined the art form. Page was an American pinup icon who scandalized society with her risque and alternative kink modeling photos. We can thank her for the bikini as it was Page herself who made it popular. Pop stars to this very day model themselves after her. Her iconic haircut being found on stars such as Katy Perry and Dita Von Teese. Her poses in her famous photos were found in music videos such as like, it's just, it's she had a massive amount of influence. She she redefined a sexually repressed era with her free spirit and unabashed presentation of her sexuality. But she was taken advantage of a lot of the time. Betty actually didn't make any royalties after her prince until Hugh Hefner got her an agent. But by the end of the 1950s, Betty walked away after a nervous breakdown and retired as a born again Christian. There was a lot of suffering that Betty didn't show to the world or even admit to herself. Sadly, the woman whose face everyone knew was diagnosed with schizophrenia due to severe trauma from her childhood. For years, no one knew if she had even passed away, but people were still obsessed with her until she was finally tracked down for a documentary. She refused to take any photos, but would give interviews over the phone. She finally hired a lawyer to try and recoup some of the money she lost for her image and spent her final days living with her brother in LA. Number eight, Cleopatra. Uh, duh. Uh, Cleopatra, the woman who had the world talking all the time. She made sure that whenever she entered the room, all eyes and ears were turned in her direction, jaws, on the floor. She is one of, if not the most famous Egyptian queen to ever have lived. Believing she was the goddess Isis herself, she prepared dazzling entrances wherever she went. But it wasn't just her looks, in fact, some accounts say she wasn't actually particularly outstanding in that department. It was just the whole package and how she presented herself. It was indeed her wit, charm, intense intelligence that had men and nations kneeling to her. Her brother slash husband wasn't a huge fan, as it was clear she was always trying to get past him to hold the whole title. But one way she overstepped her husband was when she had herself delivered to the Roman Emperor Caesar wrapped in a carpet naked. She easily won the senior emperor and gained him as her lover and eventually she even won the Egyptian throne, soon to become the famous Queen of the Nile. Number 7. Calf Ear Appetizers this one goes out to all the folks who like their steak well done, as this may be too much to stomach. Given the way food was prepped and handled back then, I would agree with most folks that cooking the devil out of your meat was probably just the safer bet. Sucks for me because I like my steak rare, as rare as you can make it. Blue, almost honestly, I, I love it like that. I am also willing to bet that most of you folks who like your steak well done aren't a big fan of fat and gristle. <laughs> I also love fat and grizzle. I just like meat, what can I say? What I'm getting to is calf ear appetizers. Yes, cooked calf ears, which I'm pretty sure are just like pure cartilage. Higher class women could often find themselves at parties where they would serve up this chewy delight. You'd probably just be chewing on that for a while. I feel like most people wouldn't like that. Is Chris a cartilage guy? I don't know, we'll see. Number six, hand cleavage. This goes for every inch of the skin, really, but women had to cover up back then. That means no ankles, neck, or god forbid a wrist. If a man saw a wrist, 
they would act the uh, oh well I don't know if they were that down bad but women of higher esteem wore gloves there's there's etiquette to gloves it was all part of the, the culture which means only women with dosh could practice such glove etiquette I say no woman should have the cover up she should wear whatever the heck she wants when the heck she wants to however with the gloves I believe there's a separate issue I have an issue being a big dude with asthma I sweat a lot more than the average folk it just sucks but if I was a fair lady with those gloves on well I might want to leave them on wouldn't want to ruin anyone's appetites for kaffir appetizers because the smell and the sweat it just Ooh, be gross. Ooh. Number five, dress is too big. This is something I'm glad isn't a thing anymore. I, I'm not a person who likes to dress up. I'm a simple dude. Casual and comfortable is my forte. However, uncomfortable wearing suits is. I like to think I clean up well. And I understand sometimes you gotta wear drip. It's just how life goes. Sometimes you gotta dress up. I just don't think people should be showing up to any formal events in cowboy boots and a pop collar shirt. I've known a few of those people. But what I'm really talking about here is the obtuse size of women's dresses and just the whole culture of women's fashion back then. It's just crazy. Large and overbearing dresses with enough material to use as blankets when you sleep. I know that couldn't have been fun. It just, it's horrible. Especially with my sweat problem. A few hours in a suit and maybe a few beers later and the first thing I'm trying to do is take the suit off. It gets tight and sweaty in there and it's just a lot of material. It's just, it's just too much. Too much. And doorways, trying to get through doorways. Ugh. Forget about it. Number four, fava beans. Well, after all that sweating and being around all that foulness, ladies needed to detox. How about a nice face mask made of beef? Yes, that's right. To keep their skin young and beautiful, they would drape a slice of beef over their face. Nothing like a little Hannibal Lecter before bedtime. Now, I hear you saying, well, Chad, that's not that bad. Okay, but think about this though. For the time period, that beef was probably yucky due to food processing practices of the time. And, and there's just no fridges. That means it was stinky. I hope it was at least winter before these ladies decided to beef up like that. This process of beef was supposed to rejuvenate the skin because beef contains some important vitamins for such. I just, I can't recommend that. You just walk in with the beef and, hello, darling, yes. Ugh, gross. Number three, hot Christmas. This is just so dumb. I'm just gonna go ahead and tell everyone at home right now not to do this, because I know some of you, and some of you are gonna be like, oh, thanks, Chetty, that's cool. No, don't do it. I'm a doctor, a lawyer, and a firefighter. Basically, this was a super fun game that felt like something out of Johnny Knoxville's head, not Victorian families gathering at Christmas. Basically, they would gather at Christmas to play a game called Snapdragon. You get a bowl of raisins and almonds, you pour some brandy in there, and maybe one out for your homie, and ignite the brandy. Once the bowl is on fire, the family will compete to see who can grab the flaming treats and eat them the fastest. Okay, second degree burns are not how I want to spend my holiday season, and also, in a time before smoke alarms and a modern fire service, this sounds like a really bad time. Grandpa could lose it out of his hands. Drapes catch fire, the house burns down, probably the whole neighborhood. Just a bad idea. Also, I hate raisins, so setting them on fire? Yeah, I'm out. I don't like raisins. They're gross, dude. I don't like them. Number two, crypt picks. Look, it's a part of life. It happens. You live, you love, and depending on how much your wife likes interior design, you probably have a sign hanging up like that in your home somewhere that says something like that. You know what I'm talking about. And after spending all that time in home sense, it's all over. Fade the black. Seeks to exist the forever box. There's a whole process and respect in the undertaking business. The Victorian era had a strange tradition, however. How about taking photographs with the body of a family member who has recently passed on? Yeah, that's right, I know. I couldn't believe it, really. People would sit there for minutes taking photos of those who are no longer with us because the process of taking photos was not great. This isn't the digital age, after all. This is something that the Crypt Keeper would make you do. Keep, just, and, and keep them in the album or something. Just, just not, not for your everyday family, man. That's just weird. Yeah, so now we're going to take photos. <laughs> yeah, like that's just weird. You know what I mean? It's just weird. It's weird. Number one, Jack the Ripper. Listen, the women of Victorian London feared this guy, and how can you blame them? A terror that seemed to come from nowhere and could strike from anywhere. Humans unaliving other humans is nothing new, and it probably won't be old. It won't get old soon. We, we're, this is what we do. It's kind of our thing. But this was the first modern serial unaliver. Jack the Ripper's identity has never been found. 
it's only been speculated and some studies suggest that it has been revealed but it's really hard to pinpoint something that happened that long ago. He was nasty and the crimes were awful. The photographs of the crime scene do not exactly follow today's media rules or decency as it's really just horrible and it's just really messy and bloody and just gross. It's kind of hard to talk about this era without Jack the Ripper. Women should feel safe at night no matter what era it is. That's right ladies, I'm on your side. Number 10, bottomless undies. I think I speak for everyone when I say that putting on a clean, fresh pair of underwear is a nice feeling. Gone is the brown underwear that was once white of yesterday, replaced with fresh loving linen of today. Now, if you're also like me, then you probably have some underwear with holes in it. I'll throw them out eventually, I'll, I'll get around to it, just I'll wear them a few more times first and then I'll get rid of them. But did you know that some ladies underwear in the Victorian era had no bottoms? Yeah. Part of the many layers of clothing that women were wearing back then, their underwear had no bottoms. Which to me is the whole point of wearing bloomers in the first place. You gotta keep your business warm and packed away. I just don't understand what the point of having it all hang out is. That's just, that's just stupid. I don't know. Number 9, no razors. There's a joke about the 70s, George W. Bush and garden hedges here, but I'm gonna let you fill in the blanks. Basically, this is a time in history where you cannot hop in the whip and drive on over to your local hair razor dealership because there ain't no whips and there ain't no CVS or Shoppers Drug Mart if you're Canadian. Today, you can buy disposable razors pretty much anywhere and there's multiple models for doing so. When things get hairy, you got options. Women in the Victorian era were not so lucky. They had to go for the natural look. Now, not there's anything wrong with that, it's just, I feel like a girl's gotta have her options. She gotta be able to, you know, do her own thing. Why not? Number eight. The Dirty Thames. When you think of Victorian England and the people, there's only really two classes. The wealthy and the ones who are broke and sound like they're from Peaky Blinders, love. Yeah, that's right. However, even for women of high esteem with their bottomless undies and lady mains growing a flush, the streets of Victorian London weren't very bourgeois, to say the least. Muddy dirt roads, thieves, beggars, and a really bad smell. It just didn't smell very nice. Oh, and also a really scary guy, but we'll get to that in part one. But perhaps the most disgusting was the Thames River, which after years of treating it the same way Brendan Fraser was treated after the Mummy franchise was over, it wasn't a good look. It was full of filth, sewage, garbage, and animal cadavers. So much so that it was said you could walk across the river on top of them. That is no place for a lady to be. Oof. Number seven, Mary Laveau. Mary Laveau is an absolute legend in practice and by lore. Her mysterious past and practices made her the absolute talk of the town. She was the voodoo queen of New Orleans. Voodoo or voodoo is a combination of West African religions brought over to the Americas through the slave trade. It then blended with Christianity and the traditions of indigenous peoples. Marie was the first generation of her family to be born free, but due to laws and practices of the time, Marie and her husband bought and sold around eight slaves in their lifetime. Though it was also believe that she aided in the escape of slaves as well. But what she is most famous for is her work as a voodoo queen in New Orleans. Many wealthy and politically connected individuals paid Laveau to aid in personal advice, intervention, and protection from evil energy. She also worked as a hairdresser which gave her access to information regarding her clients because honestly, let's be honest, everyone's hairdresser is their therapist. Honestly, what didn't this woman do? She also ran an orphanage and helped many children have a safe home. Laveau is a popular figure in legend and lore due to her relationship relationship to the occult, but her role in society was much larger and a little bit more scandalous than that. Number 6, Louisa Cassati. Also known as the Divine Marquise, we have yet another woman of mystery on this list. Louisa Cassati beguiled everyone she came across. She was a young, well-born heiress who married into the Lombardy aristocracy. The mundane was an insult to her. She dressed in extravagance wherever she went, dyeing her hair fiery shades, darkening her eyes with makeup and contouring with coal. Her her guiding principle in life was to imitate art, as opposed to art imitating life. But due to her extravagant presentation, she became the muse of dozens of famous artists. Thanks to her immense fortune, she traveled the world leaving a trail of lavish parties that even Gatsby would gawk at. Every party topped the last. She had a collection of very special drugs, naked servants gilded in gold, wild animals. Her tombstone reads, age cannot wither her, nor custom stale her infinite variety. Number five, Madame Madam C.J. Walker. Madam C.J. Walker broke records and blasted through glass ceilings as the first self-made
made female person of color millionaire in America. She made her fortune thanks to her homemade line of hair care products for black women. Her parents were slaves who worked in Louisiana, but she was the first of their children to be born free after the Emancipation Proclamation. After an experience with hair loss, she created the Walker system of hair care. She had a knack for self promotion that started by selling directly to the clients and then employed beauty culturalists to hand sell her wares. She not only continued to build her business, but she also kept a hand behind her to help lead future generations towards success. Walker used her fortune to help fund scholarships for women, donated large sums to NAACP and the Black YMCA, among other charities. An absolute legacy. Number 4 Mary Wollstonecraft Mary Wollstonecraft is a feminist icon who began setting the groundwork for women's rights all the way back in the late 1700s. She authored A Vindication of Rights of Women in 1792, which is considered the earliest treatise advocating for women's rights. Wollstonecraft was born in the Age of the Enlightenment in England. The Enlightenment is pretty much as it sounds, an intellectual period which advocated for reason to obtain objective truths. As part of this movement, Mary and her sister founded a girls school in London in 1780 to educate young girls. She continued to write articles advocating for the education and equality of women in society throughout her life. She believed that if women weren't educated to the same degree as men were, then society would come to a standstill. Sadly, Mary never fully saw the success of her ideas. She died during the birth of her second daughter, Mary, who, funny enough, would go on to write one of the most controversial books in history, Frankenstein. Number three, Mae West. I see a man in your life. Not only one. Mae West. As sassy as she was on screen, she was even more so off of it. Her wisecracking, quippy sensuality became a sensation people couldn't get enough of. West started out in vaudeville and Broadway before she hit the big screen, singing and doing acrobatics. By 1926, Mae began to write and produce her own plays, the first being titled Sex. Her performance was of a woman of the night and you can imagine the stir she caused. It also earned her an 8 day jail sentence for corrupting the morals of youth. She loved to ridicule social attitudes towards sexuality, which became a part of her trademark style. She was also a big supporter of the gay community, even writing a play called Drag as a celebration of drag in New York City, on top of it being a living room comedy. As you can guess, this also stirred up some serious controversy. But despite it all, Wes seemed to enjoy the reaction of the private and reserved public, loving every minute that it made her famous. Number 2 Marsha P. Johnson Marsha P. Johnson is most famously known for her work to help support the LGBT LGBTQ plus movement in New York City for nearly 25 years. Marsha played a key role in the Stonewall riots that found the gay pride movement today. She was a drag performer and black trans woman who did everything she could to advocate for trans youth, homeless people and people living through the AIDS epidemic. She even used money she earned as a night worker to help fund a refugee for homeless people. Along with fellow activist Sylvia Rivera, she founded STAR, Street Transvestite Action Revolutionaries, which created a safe place for homeless trans youth to sleep and feel safe. It was the first LGBT Q plus shelter in North America. Sadly, however, Johnson never got to see how far the movement would take the world as she died in 1992. Her body was found in the Hudson River and it was ruled that she took her own life. However, many suspect foul play as her case was never actually investigated, they just assumed. Many activists believe today that someone had indeed taken her life. Marsha P. Johnson danced, performed, and rioted her way to making the public listen to the voices people were afraid to hear, and her legacy lives on today. And last but not least, Rosa Parks. One of the loudest scandals in history that ferried in waves of change was the decision Rosa Parks made one day to stay seated on a bus. It was a scandal that transformed the world. In 1955, Parks refused to give up her seat on the bus to a white man from Montgomery, Alabama. This simple and brave refusal initiated the civil rights movement in the United States. Her actions inspired the Montgomery bus boycott, led by a young Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Up until this point, bus segregation was enforced, and the black community was forced to sit in the back of the bus always. It was also customary for bus drivers to request that black citizens give up their seat to white citizens. So one day when Parks was riding home from work, she was exhausted, the bus driver asked part of the back of the bus to stand to make room for a white citizen. Parks was the only one who refused and she was arrested as a result. In her autobiography, Parks writes, and I quote, People always say that I didn't give up my seat because I was tired, but that isn't true. I was not tired physically. No, the only tired I was was tired of giving in. Number 10 Soldier Yes, that's right. There were female soldiers during the war. Not as many as Call of Duty Vanguard would like you to believe there was, but there was. 
there was. This was the 1940s. Women were still fighting for equality, in particular the resistance groups of Europe that were fighting the oppression of German occupation, most famously being the French resistance during the German occupation of France. Women like Nicole Manet were active ground soldiers, just not in a professional army, usually operating in the shadows and with sabotage. However, every once in a while head-on-head -head combat was engaged. It's not a professional army, but they're, they're soldiers. It counts. I checked. I called the chief. He said it counts. Number 9. Spy. The name's Bond. James Bond. Except, no, it's, it's not, because we're talking about lady spies. That's right. If you asked your grandmother what she did during World War II, she might say, I worked in a factory. I was a baker, a farmer, and a nurse. Somebody worked in a military office or something like that. What you might be surprised to hear, however, is that grandma was a spy. Yes, that's right. Espionage. I think a lot of people think about the CIA, MI6, or KGB when they think about spies, and you'd be right, as that was the golden age of spy versus spy. However, everything has its start, and it all started in World War II. The OSS, for example, is stated to have over 13,000 members. One of every nine was a woman. Makes a lot of sense when you think about it. You never know who to trust really. Could be a dude, could be a woman, could be mom, could be dad. You just don't know. Could be grandma. You never know. Number eight, pilot. This is partly to do with the logistics issue of war, but again, without women in the fight, it would not have gone so smoothly. Basically, the idea boils down to we need every available man in the war effort. Soldiers, pilots, technicians, sailors, officers, engineers, drivers. Just about anyone who was able to, and even some of those who weren't, were thrown into the mix. That's what it's like for men. That means we got some uh, that means we have to get some iron-willed ladies who aren't afraid to roll up their sleeves, and that means a lot of women because women are not afraid to roll up their sleeves. That's how that's how it goes. To get the job done. This included female pilots. Not in combat, but arguably just as important. Actually, no, not arguable. It is just as important. Delivery, hear me out. The US and Britain were pumping out war machines the same way I pumped Doritos into my boiler on a Saturday night. However, if you walked into a warehouse full of complete airplanes after coming out of the factory, how do you get them to the desired area? Right. The answer is getting brave women to make countless flights in order to get the planes where they needed to be. I think a lot of people just don't think about that stuff. When you make the stuff, you gotta get it from point A to point B. And we have a lot of women to thank for that. Number seven, Typhoid Mary. My mom wasn't the best cook on planet Earth, but God willing, she tried. You know, she, she really put in a lot of work. Excuse the meme here, but she makes a mean spaghetti though. God, I love mom's spaghetti. I, re I really do. And her cookies. Oh, she makes the best cookies. Everyone should agree with me in the comments section so I can show my mom and tell her she hasn't made cookies in a while. Tell my mom to make some cookies. It's time she makes cookies, man. They're so freaking good. They're the best on earth, I swear. Well, my mother is okay. She doesn't make up the Gordon Ramsay standards. But that's okay because no matter how well Typhoid Mary made the lamb sauce, it was always going to make people green as Typhoid Mary was an asymptomatic carrier of typhoid fever. Yes, that's what we're talking about, Typhoid Mary. Crazy enough, after she found out that she was asymptomatic with typhoid, she insisted upon cooking. She kept going, which got more people sick. Surprise. She was forcibly quarantined multiple times in her life. You can't make this stuff up. Please stop cooking, you're sick. I'm gonna do what I want. You can't tell me what to do. Number six, Bell Star. You know, for those who enjoy adult entertainment, her name kind of sounds like it came from there, right? Anyway, she was a cowgirl and outlaw in the 1880s and in the Lone Star State. She was married to an Indian and oftentimes as a couple would offer help to other outlaws needing refuge at their ranch. In 1883, her and her husband were caught trying to steal a horse, very RDR of them, hmm, and spent time in the old slammer. They continued their outlaw ways until it all went Dutch Vanderlyn, meaning it didn't go very well. One day, like any other good western, a stranger had come to the ranch, kind of out of nowhere, and gave Bell Star a taste of the law. Just happened to be with a big iron. To this day, nobody knows what happened, who the stranger was, or why she was bang bang. No one, no one knows. No one, no one understands. It's crazy. There, was, there should be a movie about that. Big iron on his hip, all fancy. Anyway. Number five, Mary Surratt. I actually didn't know this one, but perhaps maybe our American audience remembers. Some will recall a time when America was divided in twain. After all, a house divided amongst itself cannot stand. A certain top-hatted, bearded president did his best to restore the union. It took a lot of years and lives, but he managed to do it. 
However, some were still not pleased, a one John Wilkes Booth to be specific had to ask the president a leaded question, if you catch my drift. Well, after assassinating one of the most beloved presidents in American history, he needed to hide. You, you gotta hide after that. And Mary Surratt was the woman who'd let him hide. So I think aiding and abetting, as well as harboring the most wanted man in America at the time, counts as scandalous. She also had some other anti-union behavior as well. Hmm, that's not good. Naughty, naughty, not very nice. Number four, Lizzie Borden. Lizzie Borden took an axe, gave her mother 40 wax. When she saw what she had done, she gave her father 41. Huh, isn't that nice? <laughs> oh boy. Yes, that's right, the late 1800s teenage daughter who maybe perhaps pulled an OJ Simpson. Nah, we're not sure, I don't know. Maybe she did not sort of brutally unalive her families. <laughs> no one else was found at the scene, and then she was acquitted. That sounds just like OJ. Which, given how women were treated back in the day, is kind of strange because I, it just feels like women who are clearly not guilty were punished for stuff they didn't do, and women who are for sure guilty get off free. Her alibi was that she was in the barn when it happened, and then she walked to the house and, Mom and Dad, what's going on here? Let me just wash off my bloody, my bloody shorts here. What? Who did that? What? That's crazy. Number three, Mary Ann Cotton. Marriage can be tough. Sure, but Marianne Cotton is the reason today you can't collect on life insurance when your spouse mysteriously, get your finger quotes out, mysteriously passes away. It all started when she predicted the passing of her stepson, and then it happened. Well, that's weird. After that, it was her husband here, and then another husband there, and well, it's starting to get a little fishy, don't you think? Well, once these unexpected passings were looked into, they all had something in common, something in their tummies. Arsenic. Yes, she was getting rid of her husband's and then trying to claim the insurance money. Evil, but ahead of her time. Like 50 years ahead of her time. That's, that's insurance fraud. That's interesting. And well, it's also, it's also like cold-blooded, calculated, unaliving, you know, but, but insurance fraud too. <laughs> Number two, Tilly Kilmick. Okay, how about a literal psychic who knew when all of our late husbands were going to pass? In the late Victorian era, Tilly Kilmick was first found predicting the passing of scruffy wild dogs in the ghettos of Chicago. It's kind of a weird thing to say, like, mm, yeah, see that dog? The dog's not gonna make it. The dog? No, he's not gonna make it. Anyway, <laughs> somehow she always knew when they were going to expire. Then it was her late husband of 29 years. That's kind of strange, 29 years, and he ends up, hmm, that's weird. After cashing the insurance money, which she got immediately, she started dating immediately, where oblivious man after man kept passing, and very shortly after she married more and more. Well, she was a regular Mary Ann Cotton, to say the least, as she too was using arsenic on her husband to collect insurance money. She eventually was arrested, and her stipulation for being in prison was that she was not allowed to cook for anyone. I think that's fair, that's good. Don't let her cook, Don't, that's a good idea. Number one, ladies of the evening. Love them, hate them, or spend a lot of money on them in Vegas. That's, that's, that's Las Vegas, baby. The era was defined by them, especially in London, whoo baby. I mean, at night, you really couldn't walk anywhere without a fair lass daintily waving her hand in hopes of luring in a customer, which wasn't really an issue given that bedroom-related sicknesses were at an all-time high. Syphilis specifically had shockingly high percentage of the population and would make you think twice. Well, it would make us think twice, it would make me think twice, but people back then, uh, they kind of just went for it. Right, is something wrong with you, love? I don't care, let's go anyway. Kicking off the list at number 10, Together At Last. Remember when you were a kid and your mom would bump into their friend at the grocery store? That was the worst. While they caught up for what seemed like hours, you were bored out of your mind just staring at like bags of rice and cleaning detergent. That's when the shrew's fiddle comes in. Two women would be locked together, hands included, and face each other. All because they were too loud or they were arguing. These were used in the Middle Ages, most commonly in Germany and Austria, and the contraption would have three holes, one for each wrist and the third for your neck. Now sometimes they would attach a bell to these shrew's fiddles to alert the town that the victim was walking by, you know, in order to talk smack, maybe huck a tomato or two. But the double fiddle, that was the worst. You weren't released until the argument had settled. Some families have an argument shirt where they put the two little siblings in and they can't take the shirt off until they get along. This is like a horrible medieval ages version of that. Much, much more uncomfortable. Not made of cotton. Or funny, just bad. 
Just all bad. Number nine, point blank period. All right, babes, let's try not to shudder, but let's talk about periods for a second. Aunt Flo, the Red Sea, Shark Week, so many names to describe a pretty sucky time for people who get their period, right? Well, it might suck these days, but back in the medieval times, it was a hell of a lot worse. They just didn't have the same kinds of resources that we have today, so a lot of people had to use their noodle to figure out how to get by. Period products weren't really a thing back then, so people had to get creative. They would use rags or other linens to fashion a pad, but underwear also wasn't really all that popular yet. So they had to find a way to keep things in place They would also sometimes fashion a makeshift medieval tampon of sorts where they would wrap cotton fabric around a twig and shove it up their hoo-ha Sounds mighty uncomfortable if you ask me. Some people would also seek out bog moss because it was remarkably absorbent, so they would make their period products out of that sometimes too. This type of moss garnered the name blood moss because of its use in treating wounds and use in period products. For other people who just couldn't create these kinds of things, they would just resort to wearing red the whole time, so everything just kind of blended in. Menstruation, but make it fashion. Number eight, the ducking stool. This next one requires so much effort as like a team. I can't believe this was a real thing. The ducking stool was made to punish women involved in sexual activities. How dare you? Shame. Men were punished too, but if we know anything about history, it was mostly women who had to put up with this shit. There was first the standard ducking stool, so women would have to sit in this chair, strapped down while sitting outside of their home, or they were carried down the street. Humiliation at its finest. The town would be like, that sucks, can you believe it? Let's take the day off work and embarrass them now. Losers, they're the losers. So stupid, so backwards. The second version of the ducking stool was essentially the same thing, only it was ducked into a river over and over and over again to cool her moderate heat. At least that's what French writer Francois Maximilien Misson says. They should cool off all those angry villagers, if anything. I don't know, dip them in the river. They're the ones burning with rage because somebody who lives over there had sex once. It's really weird, go home, relax. Next up for number seven is the piquette. The perfect device for your DIY executioner. All you need is a stake, a hole in the ground to stick it out of, some rope, and a little bit of friendship. It was usually used as a military punishment, however the piquette did make its rounds, even ending up in a famous illustration of a woman being subjected to it during the French Revolution. All right, so what you need to pick up from your Hobby Lobby or your Michael's Craft Store is a stake. You're gonna stick one end of it in the ground and then the exposed end facing upwards. Make sure to grab a saw and sandpaper because you're gonna need that exposed end to be sharpened to a rounded point, not a pointy point. Now grab some rope and your malefactor, who is typically a soldier who had disobeyed order, or a woman accused of witchcraft or sleeping around, you're gonna use that rope to suspend them from the tree by this region of the thumb, while the sole of their opposite bare foot was balanced on top of the stake. The point of the stake was sharp enough to jab into the arch uncomfortably, but not enough to pierce your foot. Want to get the pressure off? You have to regulate all your body weight into the thumb that's suspending you, and yes, you may be thinking, wouldn't that tear your thumb from its socket? Absolutely, which is why you'd shift your weight back onto the painful foot. Pretty ingenious methodology, if you ask me. Nobody died, but some people did lose thumbs. Better than your life, though. This is a classic mention on our channel. Number six is the shame masks. If they tried to use those on us today, I personally don't think it'd work. The way that pride and ego function in modern days is so different from olden times, but back then, I guess it must have been an efficient humiliation tactic for them to have so many of these horrible masks. That, or people really vibe with the Halloween vibe. These masks, as mentioned, are meant to humiliate, and I guess there's nothing more humiliating than being compared to a pig or a rooster. Two of their most common designs. Some would have a pig snout, bird beak, devil horns, donkey ears. Bells are sometimes attached to attract the attention to the wearer, or even whistles attached to the mouthpiece, so anytime they breathe, the stupid thing would make a sound like the Tin Man from Wizard of Oz was approaching. Although less vicious than many other torments, they could still be painful and distressing, especially if your sentence is a long one. The mask can make it difficult to eat, drink, sleep, and could attract violence from hostile people or lecherous men. They were used as punishments for various misdemeanors, but usually it was to shut a woman up, literally. You scolded your husband, that's a serious sin that contravened the Bible's clear instructions for wives to remain subservient, little 
Well, I was gonna say Barbie dolls, but maybe after the movie, it's Ken's. Number five is also used to shut wives and women up. It's the Shrews Fiddle and Fife. But I could be wrong. It could be pronounced Fife like the country or Thief like Thief. Cannot tell for the life of me. Anyways, you've heard the boring Shrews scold a hundred times. I'm here to bring you a new exciting product if you want to publicly shame some women, but also simultaneously make it look like they're starting Medieval Times' most vibing jazz band. The Shrews Fiddle or Shame Fiddle was a wooden contraption shaped roughly like a fiddle, or a fife, or fief, or whatever it is, which is a type of flute that acted like a portable stalks for your fingers and your neck. The shame flute was specifically designed to punish those who made bad music. However, these shrews implements are titled after the ladies that were tossed in them constantly, people who spoke up to their husbands or argued with one another. The next four titles on this list, I'm not kidding, are all rippers of some kind. We're gonna start with number four, the chest ripper. If I instinctually put my hands on my chest while we're talking, you will understand why in a second. This was a device made specifically and only for women to destroy a very specific aspect of femininity and thus remove what the medieval people perceived to be her desirability. And man, did these dudes have a weird ass fixation on doing stuff to breasts. Burned, brand, carved, or simply amputated. This is called sensual torture, but swap the N and the S for the letter X. It extends back to the time of ancient Rome and likely long before then too, but worst of all was a device coined in medieval England known as the breast ripper, a metal claw that pierced the flesh of the breast of the victim who was tied down and then pulled away forcibly, shredding it to pieces. It was used as both a method of punishment to mark breasts of unmarried mothers and women convinced of heresy, adultery, and hosts of other crimes, but also for interrogation because nothing is gonna make someone confess to being a witch faster than a sociopath with a giant pair of tongs. Number three is a rear ripper. It's unlikely, but if there was anything worse than the breast ripper, it's probably the pair of angles. Recognizable now from video games and movies and leather bedrooms with red latex accents, this pear-shaped device was one of the many horrific devices that made it to the modern world, but was reborn with better purposes. A few medical devices have taken a page out of its book, such as the dreaded ch ch thing they use at gynecology appointments, and some birthing and colonoscopy gear. So the pear is made up of four leaves. These are joined at the hinge at the top and a key or a crank on one end. As you can see on screen, it's named accordingly. The pear was inserted into one of the three viable orifices, two if it's a dude, depending on the nature of the crime committed. The oral device was reserved for heretics, while the back door and the middle door pairs were used on, you could never guess. Witches, witchcraft, ooh. Man, medieval times must have looked like the set of Halloween Town, the way that witchcraft is constantly referenced. Anyways, turning the key open the leaves and every little click click of the key causes massive internal damage that was rarely fatal, but very thorough way to get a confession out of someone, or just about any Anything. I'm pretty sure the average person would admit to something as ludicrous as riding a magic donkey out of the king's palace if it meant that would stop. Number two is another rear ripper. Yeah, they liked those. Come to think of it, for such a sensually repressed society, they seem to get quite raunchy with their punishments. It's almost like that's the reason you shouldn't repress feelings like that. The Judas Cradle, also known as the Gilded Cradle, was a regular stool with a wooden or metal pyramid on the top. The victim would be stripped, tied with ropes on all four four limbs, and then like some elaborate marble movie set up behind the scenes, they get lifted into the air and suspended just over top of the pyramid. Then their bits are adjusted to sit right on top of the pyramid. From here, the captive holder could torment them further, try to get confessions, whatever, before letting loose more and more of the person's own body weight, which would slowly impale them downwards on the pyramid, which in turn would start making room for itself. This punishment method was frequently used in the Inquisition, but I invite you to guess when else could it be? A, witchcraft, uh, B, witchcraft, or C, witchcraft. If you guessed any of those three, you're right, because pretty much every medieval punishment for a woman was because she talked too much or made a soup that tasted too good, so the devil must have done it. All right, the last one on our little ripping montage, number one is the rail rip, AKA a wooden horse, also known as riding the rail. It's an eft device of which there are two variations. The first is like a balance beam from gymnastics, but triangular, mounted on a sawhorse like support. The victim is made to straddle the triangular horse and place their full body weight down on the hoo-ha area, which rested on the blunt point of the angle. Weights and additional restraints were added to keep the victim from falling off, 
but also to drag them down. Left for days, it can begin destroying your pelvis as well as dislocate all of the joints in your legs. A less immediately painful variation is a single plank of wood supported again with the wooden legs or sometimes suspended from the ceiling, horizontal from the floor on its side with a thin edge and sharpened extremely. The victim is made to straddle the plank, which is adjusted to their height so that they have to stand on their tiptoes or let their hoo-ha, meet a very serrated fate. This wasn't a witchcraft one, ironically, but rather for adulterers, working girls, or women who breathed a little too hard and their husbands wanted them gone. Number 10, farming. In a world with a lack of food, not because I ate it all, which is honestly a good reason, peasantry had to work on their farms, not only to feed the rich, but also themselves. So if the men in your household are ill or sick, then that means it's rivet rosy time, or farming friend time, whatever you want to call it. I don't need to tell any farmer out there how tough their job can be. Being a medieval woman farmer, that's tough. Also, they probably weren't allowed to wear clothing that was more suitable for plowing fields. And of course, there's a woman trying to do a man's job. How dare she? People just should have let them be. There's a good chance the crops wouldn't make it either. A green thumb would have come in very handy. A tough job nonetheless. Number nine, beer maiden. This one goes out to any woman who's ever had the pleasure of working at a certain restaurant that's fixated on women's chests. You know the one I'm talking about. Or any woman who had the absolute pleasure of working at a golf course clubhouse. Keep your mitts to yourself, you filthy animals. I can't imagine the bar maidens of yieldy times had better luck. There really aren't a lot of laws to protect them either. But basically, they helped serve ale in the taverns and inns, which brought in all kinds of unsavory types. Mind you, it's not as bad as it would be in Skyrim or you know other fantasy RPGs, but it's still a sour bunch. Sometimes there were just barrels of ale and the maiden's job was to simply just keep filling the tankards and handing them out. I'm sure she was well respected and not even once ever had her personal space infringed upon, right? Of course not, no. Number eight, caring for children. Hey, someone had to do it. A woman's job is never done. At least that's what my mom, my aunt, uh, my grandma and pretty much every woman I've ever known has always said. Okay, sure, I was a little bit of a handful. I was loud and energetic and, and I loved to talk. Teachers always said I was a distraction in class. All right, maybe I was, and maybe I still am. Okay, I am. But at least the women caring for me had the modern amenities of the 21st century. A fridge full of fresh food, washing machines, cars, and a solid structure with four walls. So you can imagine if you had to deal with a kid like me back in ye olde times, just with none of the nice stuff that makes life today a lot of fun. Ye olde Chetty running amok. Oh, mother, mother. It's because of a cheater's fama, number seven. While fama is a Latin term for reputation and good name, every country had its own version of this fama. And if you cheated, or were even just accused of cheating in 13th century France, which by the way happened a lot because husbands just want to get rid of their wives, the woman was always the center of the punishment, even if that was the man who had been cheating. This is because the status is all a woman ever had for a very long time, and the name of her family's reputation laid on her shoulders. Shoulders. Thus, all that pressure to be religious, virtuous, and most importantly, a submissive woman. The customary laws of Agen province list public humiliation for both the wife and her lover as the appropriate punishment for adultery. If the man could escape before or even after arrest, he could get off without any punishment and his partner had to face her punishment alone. The woman got no such reprieve, even if she was just the mistress he cheated on his own wife with. In fact, if she tried to escape arrest, it warranted a death sentence. Women whose fama suffered through public like shaming walk of atonement were no longer deemed honorable members of society and seeing as damning of individuals before law at the time was often based on their reputations, what others thought of them and how they behaved in public, she'd be left, as I said, homeless, familyless, and dejected. For my Game of Thrones people, think Cersei. Number six is no protection. Get your mind out of the gutter. That's not what I'm talking about. I mean, there's no protection from capital punishment. While civil laws were easier to work around by just getting married alone, you can borrow money or property, you you can buy things that you couldn't before and sign contracts. The criminal law didn't bend to a married woman, as she faced the same penalties as an unmarried one. Now, there are technically one exception, pregnancy, but only because it could potentially be a boy, which is insane. Additionally, all women were exempt from certain torts. 
such as the breaking wheel. But man, when a woman got capital punishment, it was the one and only form, and it was the most brutal and painful one, burning at the stake. By the way, they claim this was the only and the necessary option of execution for a woman, as it's a preservation of female modesty. Apparently, other forms of execution were unbecoming of a woman. Although there may be some truth to this wild justification, modern historians have rounded it down to just misogyny, as well as a deep-rooted suspicion and dislike of women as the root of this execution decision. Essentially, when given the opportunity to punish a woman, men went ham for it and wanted to see her suffer as much as possible. So women experienced the worst executions of the Dark Ages. Number five is why women want to stay in religious favor. In medieval Europe, a device was literally invented for women who defied their religious beliefs. Pyramid shaped and made of wood, the woman who dared to defy her god should fear this. See, they would bind the woman's hands and ankles and then sit one of her two genital openings on the peak of the pyramid. She would then be incapable of shifting her weight anywhere else and was forced to put her weight down on the tip. It would slowly slide upwards and inwards and the longer she was pressed down on it, the more her body split apart. These women would be left for days on end sometimes on this device. The device's slow, agonizing death can be compared only to the shame it inflicted as well. The woman was stripped nude and forced to suffer this torture in public for all to see. Number four is harems. To start, the word harem is derived from the Arabic word harim, and it often means sacred, forbidden, and sometimes sanctuary. This was an accurate name for, as only women's household members and some related male members were allowed to enter a harem, which was an honored women's space. The harem was the ultimate symbol of a sultan's power, his ownership of women, mostly slaves, was a sign of wealth, power, and sexual prowess. The seclusion from public gaze also inflated this power more so. But a royal harem could be a place of filth and stink where chaos and emotions ran high. This was the price of being property. Used by the emperors and his sons, you could either be favored or so hated that one day you vanish and rumors of your exile whirl amongst your peers. These ladies usually did not have the liberty to move out of the harem as they liked, but inside the harem they could move around as they pleased. There was no sisterhood in them either. Socializing amongst themselves was usually not friendly and jealousies were shown directly. Makes sense, as status and position of authority in the harem were determined by the place that they had in the emperor's favor, and to give the king his first male child was a great competition in this regard, resulted in unpleasantness through the royal harem. Everyone tried their best to please the emperor and turned her bad qualities like jealousy, aggression, or short tempered attitude onto other women. Seeing as many of these women were stolen from outside the empire, let alone inside, frustration with language barrier and culture clash was also a huge source of contempt. Sometimes the women would lie to the sultan to have others disposed of, or they'd simply gang up on one another. Regardless, harems were places of drama, inequality, and a race to be favored as a ticket out of sexual servitude. Hidden sexuality is number three. There were plenty of mainstream laws in medieval and middle Europe against male homosexuality, and while it wasn't considered a serious, lesbianism still posed a threat to the ideals of a male-centric societal order. A law written in 1260 France stated that women caught in engaging in homosexuality, she'll undergo mutilation on her first and second offense, and on her third, she must be burned. This is one of the only laws to specify consequences for lesbianism, but the 13th century and Christian perspective of sex radicalized further into modesty. Lesbianism was equated to sodomy at that time point and therefore carried a similar sentence. Death. There is sufficient evidence of lesbians in middle ages, most of which come from the church. Turns out many nuns were sexually active lesbians and the church directly acknowledges their presence by having to pass laws establishing penalties for nuns caught having sexual relations with each other. So not only were they having sexual relations with each other, but it was enough that the church had to do something about it. For example, during the 8th century, Pope Gregory III gave penances of 160 days for unnatural female acts. Still, no torture or death though. This is because as long as phallus or other phallus shaped objects weren't used or involved, the relationship wasn't considered real intercourse. Real intercourse involved procreation after all. So eventually when Christianity upped the ante however, any sexual act that caused pleasure, which now included lesbian intercourse or plain old self stimulation, was now considered sin. So like most women of the middle ages, even bisexual and lesbian women had to settle down for a man at that point. Anyone who struggled with sexuality can imagine how dreadful it would be to live that way. Divorce was 
a nightmare, which is why it's number two in our countdown. Laws worldwide were unforgiving of divorces, literally always to the woman. In Chinese laws, a woman could only divorce her husband if he mistreated her family, not even her. He, on the other hand, could divorce her for anything. Some accepted grounds for divorce were failure to bear a son, evidence of being unfaithful, lack of piety to the husband's parents, theft, suffering a virulent or infectious disease, jealousy, and talking too much. Uh, pretty superficial list, but in Chinese society, divorce was a serious action with social repercussions for both parties, so consequently divorces were not as common as they may sound. She could not be divorced if she had no family to return to or if she had gone through the three year mourning period for her husband's dead parents. And speaking of family, during the Han Dynasty, unmarried women brought a special tax on their family and women with babies were given a three year exemption from the tax and their husbands a one year. So there was a huge push to get married. Meanwhile in medieval England, their similarities are stark. They too had a small number of divorces despite an expansive list of reasons to do so, such as there was a discovered blood relation between the individuals, or impotence, or fear used to obtain consent, the marriages entered into under false pretenses, things like that. In many of these cases, the lack of sufficient evidence made them difficult to prove and thus deterred people from taking their cases to court. And number one is the tradition of foot binding. It existed for around 10 centuries, and there are women alive today who still have feet that are the result of feet binding. Foot binding involves systematically breaking the feet and shaping them inwards. This tradition started in the Five Dynasties Ten States period of the 10th century, when beloved concubine of the emperor built a gilded lotus flower stage and performed a dance on bound hoof shaped feet. Being a beloved concubine, the other concubines of the emperor attempted to imitate her feet to curry his favor. So foot binding began within the royal court and spread through China as the next fashion fad. It's done in a ritualistic ceremony accompanied by a variety of traditions to ward off any bad luck. They began by tucking the toes under the feet and using a long, tight ribbon wrapped up to the ankle to hold it all in place. Anytime the foot grew, they broke it inwards more, a process usually taking two to three years. The foot would remain bound for the rest of a woman's life. There is a whole list of issues this caused. Outside of extreme agony and being a handicap, it caused some women pain for the rest of their life. Their walk was changed, as was their posture, and the idealism of a slim body to lighten the pressure on one's feet was all the rage. The binding of feet actually caused the women to develop strong muscles in their hips, thighs, and buttocks, so much that the characteristics were considered physically attractive to Chinese men of the area, aka the girlies were thick. When colonization came to China, western women boycotted foot binding, going as far as to catch women with bound feet and cut off their bindings, a humiliation because these women would never ever show their bare feet to anyone, let alone even husbands. And many of these women lost their husbands when the western boycott worked. A lot of girls who had had their feet bound in order to become marriageable, suddenly found themselves abandoned by their husbands because foot binding was no longer fashionable at all. Number 10, working in general. I know. World War I, 1914 to 1918. If you didn't guess already, this wasn't the age of women, or at least treating them right. It just wasn't. This, however, was the beginning of things changing. The war had a lot to do with that. When men went off to war, women had to fill their shoes in places of work. When in reality, a few years prior to that, a woman working was a ridiculous idea. But what's a gal gonna do when she's got no choice? Knuckle up, buckle down, and do it, do it, do it. It might seem silly today to even mention women going to work, but this is good history. In the beginning of women's suffrage, really the middle of it. Number nine, this one's really cool, I like this one, this one's crazy. The Radium Girls. Yes, the radium girls. This is just a crazy story. So, this material called radium was discovered and its glowing properties were quickly put to work for military application. You'll find a lot of times that military service often boosts technology development. Just how it goes. So when a factory that was producing glow in the dark watches for the war effort needed workers, they looked to women to stand up to the challenge. Day in, day out, these women painted with radium paint. The women were advised to keep the brushes with a fine tip by placing it between their lips. Kind of just a little lick, a little, a little kiss kind of, kind of cute. Some women even used it on their nails and others painted on each other. The novelty of glow in the dark paint quickly wore off, however, when it proved to be very harmful to one's health, especially since the women had been ingesting the harmful paint. In the end, it was radiation sickness. One woman had it so bad her jaw simply fell off. That's not it. I saw the picture, bro. It's, it's, it's just gone. It's uh, uh. Number eight, the Canary Girls. 
A very similar story to the previous, but perhaps one you may be unfamiliar with. The Canary Girls sing a familiar tune to that of the Radium Girls, except it wasn't radioactive, but rather just TNT. How could TNT be harmful besides when it blows up, right? That's what I thought. The only trouble I've seen with TNT is when Wile E. Coyote accidentally blows himself up trying to get the Roadrunner. That's where I get all my scientific knowledge from. I'm a scientist, what can you say? Well, besides cartoon antics, TNT was quite harmful due to the chemicals that made it up. So harmful, it would make the women sick. It would turn their skin orange and hair yellow, like a big bird yellow. Yeah, that yellow. It even sadly affected children born whose mothers had been exposed to the chemicals. Canary babies, as they were so called. This is why we have work safety rules. And ladies, next time there's a global conflict, check what's in the factory first before they throw you in there. You don't want to catch any of that, that's bad for you. Wig makers are number seven. Egyptians loved wigs for a reason that surprises many. It helped keep their heads cool. I mean, it also helped with hygiene and scalp pests and looking pretty, but the heat thing is what really gets folks. Many Egyptians had shaved or cropped hair, and the mesh-like base of a wig versus a headscarf allowed the body heat to still escape. And as said, wigs were also a great shield from lice or other invasive bugs. The hair used in the construction of wigs and hair extensions was always human and was either an individual's own hair or had been traded or bought. Hair itself was a valuable commodity ranked alongside gold and incense in a count list from the town of Cahoon, which puts emphasis on the popularity of wigs. When hair was collected for a wig, it was thoroughly combed and then sorted into lengths individually. The Egyptians invented a variety of hairdressing tools and the wig makers would take the time to braid or coil the hair depending on the wig style, coating each with warm beeswax and resin fixative so that it would harden when cool. The job itself isn't unusual, more so the booming industry it had. Wigs weren't worn to this extent anywhere else at the time, and while yes they were functional against the sun, they were more so aesthetic than anything. Individual braid and extensions could also be attached to someone's scalp for aesthetics, the way that box braids, twists, faux locks, and many other ethnic hairstyles are accomplished today. Wigs were made in a type of factory setting. Archaeologists have uncovered the remain of wig factories, wig boxes have been found in tombs, and multiple mummies have been found with wigs or braided in extensions. Number 6, we meet our ladies of the night. Unlike most ancient and even modern civilizations, selling intercourse is illegal or was highly governed. In ancient Egypt, this wasn't even close to the case, but rather the opposite in a peculiar way. Women who worked in the sexual industries were considered divine and respectable, as their career was considered to please the gods. They earned high status and lived in luxury. Working freely and openly, these ladies adorned themselves with red lipstick and eye makeup that differentiated themselves from other women. They were also tattooed, diamond-shaped dots along the thighs and on the fingers or images of the god Bess. When the French invaded, they brought STIs, and they spread rapidly through the brothels, and this prompted the French authorities to introduce a law forbidding French troops from entering the brothels or having these ladies in their rooms. Guess those ladies were hard to resist, because anyone who offended the law received death penalty. Number 5 are the wet nurses. Wet nurses are found in all statuses, and were for all statuses. One common denominator though is that the career kind of really sucked, pun intended. So, first their social status was always determined by the status of who they were breastfeeding. Royal family, congrats on your special privileges, statues, private quarters, and your own tomb in the family pyramid. Also, her family would receive special perks as an extension of her. Now, royal families only wanted high status wet nurses, and while it's not clear how they were chosen, evidence suggests some kind of blood tie or faint familiar relation. Most wet nurses were from marginalized families in lower socioeconomic statuses and worked under conditions and pre-definitive wages. Wet nurse requirements for any status were intense. She'd have to have given birth at least twice, have a large but healthy body due to the belief that large bodies were more nourishing. Despite that, her breasts should be medium. Too small, not enough food. Too big, the baby's spoiled. In addition to all of these prerequisites, the wet nurse should be sweet-tempered, affectionate, and responsive to her charge. She should also abstain from intercourse because it could reduce her affection towards a child, and they also said no alcohol. A good call, knowing what we know now. Wet nurses were women exploited for the products of their bodies. As slaves, they were coerced for their milk as lower social status women, they were employed for their bodies to enhance their inadequate domestic status. Even her own household suffered physically and monetarily if a wet nurse defaulted or failed a contract. On the same page, surrogates are number four. This is a widespread practice in Egypt. The first story of surrogacy found in Genesis 16 of the Bible was the story of infertile Sarah having Egyptian Hagar carry her child for her and her husband Abraham. Even Egyptian pharaohs had used concubines to produce heirs. 
They often married their sisters or aunts, and children born of these marriages were most of the time not in great or functional health and wouldn't survive. Any child born of a concubine for a pharaoh was accepted as his lawful offspring. Now, they were quite limited in their rights, and they could only inherit the throne in case of the absence of another more entitled heir. Surrogates experienced similar contracts and status leveling as wet nurses. They were desired to be mothers already, have a bigger, healthier body, and naturally beauty was a desired element as well. Women of low status who made a career of surrogacy often died in childbirth or from hemorrhages due to the repetitive birthing process, but for some, it was the only career they could have. Priestress is number three, and so while it was a male dominated field, many women were employed as a priestress or a high priestress at the temples around Egypt. Mostly from upper status, many were married to the priests, which they owed their position in society. Despite this, they played roles in the temple rituals, such as servicing goddesses Hathor, Neith, and Paquette, or working as dancers, musicians, singers, and acrobats in the temple. The most important priestress was known as the god's wife Amun. This woman was usually the daughter of the pharaoh or sometimes his wife. She usually held a very high position in court and performed important rituals to honor the god Amun. The priestress was in charge of managing the gods' affairs, attending to ritual dances and performances, shaking their rattles and rattling their necklaces, which were long and heavily beaded objects. By the beginning of the New Kingdom in 1550, the title Chantress of Amun was used, and it was usually the wives of the priests who gained these elevated positions as well. The concept of a woman as a priest was unheard of in many kingdoms. A high priestess and the reverence and traditions of female gods being led by women were unusual to outsiders of Egypt who oftentimes restricted most priestly activities to just men. Number two is professional mourners. Okay, so here's a weird one. Professional or paid mourning is an occupation not only found in Egypt, but in China, the Mediterranean, and Eastern Europe. This practice is literally paying a stranger to attend a funeral to lament, deliver a eulogy, help comfort the family, entertain, or lay on the ground wailing. There's some range here, depends on what kind of funeral you want to have. These paid mourners made ostentatious displays, messy hair and smudged makeup, wailing, pounding on the ground or their chest, throwing themselves about as they smear dirt and sand all over their body while they screamed. It's a full spectacle. Now, another depiction of the paid mourners in Egypt is a little more chill. Two women impersonating the goddesses Isis and Nephthys. They were believed to play a special role in someone's death. Most inscriptions of a funeral where they are present as paid mourners, they are on each side of the corpse and their bodies are fully shaved. These women also had to be childless and have a tattoo of either Isis or Nephthys' name on their shoulder. Most evidence of professional mourning is seen in pyramids and tomb inscriptions, such as women holding their bodies dramatically in sorrow, braced over a casket with tears flowing. If you were a theater kid, this was definitely the type of job for you. And number one, it's the female physician. Egypt is a difficult one with historians. There's been a lot of largely ignored discoveries due to the opinions of those who found them. The evidence of women in ancient Egyptian medical fields is part of that because as it turns out, their physicians were actually primarily women. Evidence shows women in the medical profession going back into early dynastic period Egypt when Marit Ptah was the royal court's chief physician in 2700 BCE. She was the first female doctor known in world history, but there is another unnamed female physician who is listed to be the head of the Temple Neith Medical School in 3000 BCE, so maybe not. But either way, the first female doctor was in ancient Egypt. Women were highly respected throughout Egypt's history and many of their goddesses represented facets of health. Neith has been associated with the invention of birth and Hathor represents fertility. Four deities associated with healing are Heka, Sekhmet, Serket and Nephritim, which are all female. So, bizarre claims you may have heard that no women are involved in Egyptian medicine don't accord with the values of their civilization, which were incredibly equitable. By this reasoning, there were no women involved in anything of no anywhere in the world until the modern era, because history books make no mention of their contributions. But it's all up to say. In at number 10 is jewelry making. Egyptians saw deep spiritual significance in their jewelry, but also had a love of aesthetics. And those two things combined to create some of the most unique and lavish jewelry found in history. Worn to ward off spirits, protect health, bring good luck, and more, there were even certain colors and designs that were associated to certain gods and powers. And so Egyptian jewelers 
followed very strict rules regarding the mystical aspects of their jewelry creations. While a woman usually would not be a metal worker in Egyptian society, it was very common for her to be making jewelry. The tools were smaller and the process required less heat and thus less danger for her. Metal work techniques included precious metal sheets that were cut and shaped, notched together. Wire work was accomplished through strip twisting. Pieces could be held together with this wire stripping system or crimping techniques. These strips were also how link chains were accomplished, as well as the securing of beads or the backs of earrings. And for jewelry designed exclusively for burial, the metal was often quite thin, as the jewelry of the deceased was not subjected to the wares of everyday life. Precious stones, ivory, real flowers, and shells were all common ornaments, as was name engravements, but it was more common with royalty. Jewelry makers were women of high status due to these contributions and the revelry jewelry held in ancient Egypt. For number nine, it's house vendors. Recognized as an ancient heritage profession and was at its most popular during time periods of ancient Egypt where women were restricted from going out when married. These vendors would roam neighborhoods with buckets and baskets of product for sale. Clothing, perfume, fabric, snacks. Now, what was unusual is that the vendor was more often women than men. Walking the streets alone, making these sales because many married women weren't allowed to go out walking the streets alone to make sales. You see the irony. Anyways, this profession found great popularity in single women, and many also were called upon to act as nurses in homes of the wealthy when needed. The career is named Al Dalala, but the idea itself has long been extinct with the freedom for Egyptian women to roam commercial districts. Number eight is being a dancer. Ancient Egyptians loved their music and dance. They were celebratory, but also ritualistic at times. Farmers would dance to thank the gods for a good harvest. Dance groups would perform at banquets. People would go dance around the Nile in the lush season. The list goes on. Many men and women chose dance as a career, and it was a highly respected one. Dancing was considered an acceptable and normal part of life and even important to it. Most festivals were incomplete without it. In fact, dancing was such a revered career that dancers could start as a peasant and become a high status person from it. Just like being a celebrity in the way that people would go to see them perform. Women at the time were even more revered for their grace, elegance, and action. Acrobatics. This career had seven types of dance. Gymnastic, movement, pair dancing, imitative dance, which was like acting like animals, group dances, like a historic cheerleading squad, dramatic dance was female exclusive and rested in illustration, war dances, grotesque dance, and then religious chant dances at temples, and lyrical dance, which was usually a depiction of lovers. Number seven, the streets. Unusual to most, but very common to women of ye olde times. When you're a woman who's got nothing, sometimes you gotta give something. That something just so happens to be what's hiding in your pants. It's a profession that's as old as time, and it will not be going anywhere anytime soon. Women work the streets. I don't think that's anything to be ashamed of. Number six, Joan of Arc. It doesn't get more unusual than the savior of France. England and France were having a go at it if you will, which if you know history was like round 12 of 100. Anyway, it wasn't going too well for France, it was going rather poor actually. The same kind of poor I got on my report cards under the paying attention section. Oops. Then there was Joan, really a, a nobody, when one day she heard the voice from a higher power that she was to drive the English out of France. Naturally, the people around her, especially the men, scoffed at the thought of a young woman being the hero they needed. But given that they had nothing to lose, suited her up and sent her out. Plot twist, she did very well, like crazy good. The Battle of Orléans proving her grit. The English were so confused and disgruntled by a young peasant girl defeating their armies, they thought it was only proof of one thing, that she wasn't a sign of God, but rather a sign of the devil. How dare a woman beat us in, that's man stuff, you can't do that. Number five. Queen. It is unusual. Most people didn't get to be royal. I mean, think about it. Seriously. Although, I certainly like to be. I can't just imagine it. King of the internet. King of the black hoodie. Nice. Or king of the Chinese buffet. My point is that while women in medieval times didn't get the respect that they deserved, and every girl does, queens just had it better. And that's unusual. The queen might not have been as well respected as the king, but compared to the peasantry, she was fed. Had four walls around her that didn't leak or wind would you know, seep through or blow down, and wasn't working herself to the grave every day to provide for a king and queen that didn't think very much about them. That's a really hard life to live. Number four, cooking. Chief, somebody had to do it. 
Although, there's something that tells me the food wasn't that good. This isn't exactly Gordon Ramsay's five-star cuisine. Beans, cabbage, eggs, onions, bread, and of course, beer or ale to wash it down. The peasantry just didn't have the same access to food like royalty did. Although with a list like that, it sounds like it's a fast track way to an upset stomach or some really grody gas, dude. It was women who would often be preparing those delicious dishes. Besides the hours I would spend on the commode after visiting a commoner's house from eating that, the taste is something we're talking about, I think. When you guys are cooking chicken, for example, what are your favorite recipes, spices, flavors? Let us know in the comments, I'm curious. My favorite chicken is barbecue chicken, brushed with a little Diana sauce. Medieval folks just didn't have that. More upsetting than that is the lack of spices in general. While there were some, anything not local would have been crazy expensive and not available to common folks. Medieval women did the best with what they could when they had it. That's just how it goes, Chief. I talked to him, he's a chef, he said it's all right. Number three, nuns. It makes sense, honestly. Becoming a woman of God, was honestly a good career choice for a woman. For starters, you become a woman of God and that means you're protected under his vision. Thank you, Jeebus. And people need that back then, seriously. Secondly, it would also give you a place to live. Some nuns stayed in one town and others traveled where needed. Staying in monasteries and convents where it was possible. And probably more comfortable than living in the mud and stone huts that the serf women were living in. And lastly, they got rulers and sticks. And if someone was bad, they would punish them when they misbehave. Oh, sorry sister, I didn't mean to say naughty words in the classroom. I guess you'll have to spank Chetty now, ooh. All jokes aside, this might have been one of the best things for a woman to be, besides royalty or marrying rich. It's just how the times went. Number two, landowner. I was shocked by this one too, honestly, but yes, women could own land, sort of. It wasn't a blanket green light. It's a bit more confusing than that. Some could, some couldn't. There was a few rules here and there. They were stupid man patriarch poo poo rules, but rules nonetheless. In Normandy, for example, only men and their sons could possess land ownership. In the Basque region, both sons and daughters could inherit land. In England, both could, but if there were any surviving men or brothers, then they would be considered first, and not women at all sometimes. So, no, it's not as open as today, and you probably would catch some strange looks as a woman rolling up to an empty lot and staking your shovel in the ground. It makes life a lot easier if there aren't so many rules, and I know you guys agree with me at home. The less red tape, the better, right? And be nice to girls, be nice to women. Number one, artists. This one hits home. I think Chris can agree with me on this one. A lot of male artists, writers, and poets get remembered from history, but there was a few decent female ones too. We gotta give them some spotlight. Just It sucks that males get all the spotlight. To me, this makes sense. In my experience, a lot of girls I knew growing up had natural talent for arts. I remember growing up in school and art class was always one of my worst subjects. No, not because I didn't follow directions, but my art never came out the way I wanted it to. I, I didn't feel the motivation, baby. I, didn't, I couldn't see the motivation. Most of the girls in art class just passed with flying colors. No pun intended. And for writing, well, besides my dyslexia, if you looked at a paper I wrote in the sixth grade versus a girl from my classroom in the sixth grade, what's the difference? Well, you can actually read hers. I, mine are terrible. All grade school antics aside, notable artists and writers include Clerica, Gouda, that's a cool name, and Hildegard of Bingen. Names you might not know, but for sure are worth a Google search. So, in at number 10, we have witch marking. I'm trying to avoid some things we've already covered in similar videos, so while we've discussed witches, let's talk about witch marks. So during the English and Scottish witch hunt days, there was a belief that witches always had a natural skin mark. This could be a mole, or a scar, or a pock mark, or even a really bad zit. So when they came across a woman whom they thought were a witch, but she didn't have any of those markers, that was the end of it, right? She isn't a witch? Well, no. They gave her a skin mark instead, specifically by using a pricking needle which the witch hunters would carry. These needles repeatedly pricked the flesh of the accused until it produced the result that wouldn't bleed but was insensitive to pain, which fulfilled the criteria of a witch's mark. It's a subtle punishment for something that they were yet to be accused of because by giving them the mark they could now accuse them. These witch hunt days were a whole mess. Number 9 is marking your territory. Not in a cool, sexy, I got a tattoo way, more in a scarlet wetter kind of way. As as you'll learn in this video, a woman who cheated or even was single and just engaged in intercourse of her own free will could be classified as a sinful adulterer and cheater and be punished, usually a lot worse than a man. So when Nathaniel Hawthorne wrote The Scarlet Letter, he took inspiration from real life events. The letter, which for the character Hester Prynne was just a red A, was usually the letters AD, which stands for adultery, as outlined 
outlined by the Plymouth Colony Law in 1658. Multiple accounts across Europe verify that someone who has been marked was to be seen out in public without it, could be subject to public whipping and other public humiliations that ensured a person's social alienation. Like in the Scarlet Letter, when Puritan minister Arthur refuses to admit his sinful side of the act with Hester, he's branded with an A in his chest. In a man's case, while this was of course painful, it was allowed to be hidden. He also didn't have to face the societal consequences the way any woman would have. For number 8 we travel to discuss status degradation. While it still persists today, not everyone knows what it means. So essentially you do something wrong, oopsies, you lose some of your basic human rights. You could steal something, have relations out of wedlock, cheat on your partner, miss some work. Every empire that has used this tactic has had a variety of ways that you could mess up and receive this punishment. Naturally, in times where a woman was property and couldn't buy things, own things, or do things, or breathe without having a man side eye her for it, this was a monumental punishment to receive. Under the Roman Empire Augustus, who reigned from 27 BCE to 14 CE, a woman guilty of adultery could lose several rights as a citizen and suffer a financial burden. Noble women in the Kingdom of Korea during the Joseon Dynasty faced a similar degradation of their societal status if they were found guilty of remarrying as a widow. This intentionally made it hard for Korean women to remarry as they would have nothing to offer a new husband, no inherited lands or funds, and a societal belief deemed her as used goods. Even the descendants of widows of the time who had remarried faced status degradation. They were barred from ever holding office. Adulteresses in the Chosun were stripped of many of their rights and privileges once they were demoted to low born statuses. As serious as these punishments may seem, some high status women who committed adultery in the Chosun dynasty faced an even graver punishment, which was death. So why take someone's status from them as a criminal punishment? Well, because it's aside from the fact as a woman you'd essentially be left jobless, homeless, and without any family. Number 7. Ambulance Driver Chauffeurs and drivers were a man's job when cars began to take over the roads. You gotta imagine this is a time when cars are still really new. However, why use a man there when we could use him in the trenches? Many women were trained and drove ambulances from the battlefield staging area back to a safer safer area where doctors and nurses await your arrival. The pay wasn't great, there was lots of screaming, and a slight chance of getting shelled by German artillery. There's a part of me that always gets nervous while watching footage of this time period. Like the cars just look kind of flimsy, right? And they look like they could fall apart at any minute. In driving through the mud and the blood, top speeds only are going to be around 20 to 30 miles per hour tops. Cars get like 40 horsepower at most, which in case you didn't know is very slow. Usain Bolt on his best day runs twice that speed. I don't know, but I, I hope you, you ever see that footage and the cars are so like, you know what I mean? Like it doesn't look they're gonna make it up the hill. It's weird. Number six, nurse. I know, I know. Yes, lots of ladies were, are, and going to be nurses. That's nothing new. And any nurse out there in the medical profession, thank you for your service. Chetty thanks you. Now, I don't need to tell anyone in the medical profession how busy a hospital floor can be on a bad night. Nurses running around, paging doctors, phones ringing, papers flying, something about a code blue. Hectic, right? Well, imagine that, but less equipment. A hundred years less technology, and all whilst under the suppression and threat of bombs. Bombardment. Great. Yeah, not so fun, right? Sure, any nurse has comfy sketchers to take her to the graveyard shift, but no nurse has blast proof equipment to treat people in a graveyard, as this is a field hospital and this is the best they can do for the time being. Yeah, see, that's not fun. It's kind of unusual. It that's unusual. Mm hmm. Yeah, it is. Number five, ladies of the trench? This makes sense. A lot of sense, really. And as weird and crazy as it might sound, it might have made the men feel a little bit better. Trench life was awful. Refer to my World War One videos here. They're pretty good, I promise. Mud, blood, rats, disease, sickness, machine guns, barbed wire, no man's land, chemical warfare, and sadly, when all that was done and gone, brutal, borderline, medieval hand-to-hand -hand combat. That just must be terrible. I played Battlefield 1. That's fun. But in real life, that's just not fun. So when soldiers were taken out of rotation for a little R&R, &R, they might be pleased to see a brothel on wheels. That's right. Or when visiting certain northern towns in France, a very legal brothel uh, houses, if you will. When Americans joined the fight, of 1,000 men being treated in hospital, 190 were being treated for a brothel related sickness. Go get them, boys. Some men would even ask for ladies who were known to possess such qualities because they knew if they caught it, it meant 30 days in a bed and not in a trench. That's honestly such a big brain play, I can't even. Number four, widow. Might not be an official occupation, but it is an official title, and officially, it sucks. 
Imagine a world where it's difficult to get by. A world where a woman is a second class citizen. So when her husband, her brother, her father, and maybe even her son get drafted to fight Germany, and don't make it back, well, it's it's not fun. Some struggled to find work, others remarried, and some had no choice but to practice the time-old tradition of the world's oldest profession, if you know what I mean. Tough times, man. Especially for the ladies, not cool. Number three, farmers. Gotta tend to those fields, partner. This is also a time where there is farm equipment, yes, but not as common as today. It would have been expensive and nowhere near the state of the art farm equipment that we have today. Milking machines, combines, tractors, you name it. In 1914, it's offspring. That's your farm equipment. That's how it works. Ever notice how farmhouses got lots of bedrooms? Well, if you can't afford to hire farmhands, then you make some. Except, however, the key issue with the last point as well as here is the men in your family getting sent to war. Not coming back for four years is a problem. Or in a worst case scenario, not coming back at all. I mean, I'm sure some came back, they just came back in boxes. Which means wives, women, sisters, and daughters had to roll up their sleeves and get to work. And I don't have to tell any farmer watching this how important their job is, or how difficult it can be. You gotta feed the folks after all. You gotta do what's right by me, Dutch. <laughs> I don't know why farming's western, but all right. Number two, dancer. Little bit of a stretch here, but hear me out. World War I ended in 1918. By 1920, the Allies' economies had picked up, but especially in America. This was a time of great success, as a wise man once said. The Roaring Twenties, while the war was over, many folks were still feeling the effects, especially in Europe. Germany wasn't doing too hot, and they're gonna come back for a sequel. It's not gonna be good. As the sale of alcohol was banned, underground clubs began to open. Speakeasies, you may have heard them from my 20s videos. Men, soldiers returning home, women and minorities of all backgrounds were hanging out in these places, which was very progressive and cool for the time. The ladies were becoming flappers, which were dancers, out of the factories and enjoying the luxuries of a healthy economy. And I'm sure some of it had to start in 1918 at least because they knew the end was coming. It had to. It just had to. Trust me, it makes sense. Number one, politicians. For the first time in a long time, women were becoming politicians. Not presidents or governors, but their voices were being heard in the political space regardless, which is huge. A one Miss Rankin was voted into the US House of Representatives in 1916. A woman's right advocate, all brought to you by women's suffrage. I don't have to tell you how unusual that really is for the time. Especially for the time. Unfortunately for these ladies, while there would be some great step forwards like earning the right to vote and social progress in the 1920s, things would go back a few steps during the 40s and the 50s and wouldn't see massive resurgence until the late 60s and 70s. You gotta remember the good stuff though, even if it's baby steps. 